What's up everybody, welcome back. I got another episode for you today. A little while ago I made some YouTube shorts of me forging some mini utensils with some bronze inlay. In the comments some people asked if I had a long form video of me forging them and I didn't, so I figured I would complete the set today by forging a wrought iron spoon with some bronze inlay. And like most of my projects, we begin at the forge. Okay, I'm over at the ugliest anvil in the world, so I can illustrate exactly what I'm doing to get the spoon bowl shape that I want without just grinding it in. This is plasticine. It's a great way if you want to experiment with your forging. You can test it out in plasticine because it basically works the same as hot metal. At this point in the video, you see me have something like like this as a preform. In order to forge as closely to finish as possible, which I always try to do in my work, I put a, a simple chisel taper. You can see that, right? So putting this simple chisel taper makes for spreading the spoon bowl to be a lot, a lot easier. Let me zoom out, this is ridiculous. So I use a cross peen hammer in my work for a very specific reason. I think it's uh, the most bang for your buck when it comes to hand forging. Uh, and this is a cross peen because the peen or the back end is perpendicular to the handle, right? Cross, it makes a cross. Uh, Pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, let me illustrate a couple things first. So the face of the hammer moves material in 360 degrees. Makes sense. The peen, however, which is essentially just a cross section of the face on the back end, you can see it's not rounded either. Uh, if it were rounded, it would behave more like a chisel. What this allows me to do is have a great deal of control where I can widen a bar So I was able to make this a whole lot wider without gaining in length. Inversely, I can gain in length without gaining in width by using it perpendicularly. Make sense? The ability to transform your material using only your hand hammer with this amount of control is pretty, like, it, it gives you a whole lot of power. So, uh, so you'll notice I put this stubby chisel taper on here. And then what I do is using the cross peen, I'm able to forge out the rest of this material without a dramatic change in length. Where I want this up here to remain relatively rounded, I want to forge out a nice spoon bowl. But I have a great degree of control just with my hand hammer. I don't need to just forge this into a giant sheet and then grind it all to shape. I can get most of the way there just with my forging hammer and a little bit of discipline and a little bit of know-how. Hopefully you get the idea that if I forge the end of my spoon just a little bit, it's less inclined to move when I use the cross peen to forge the remainder of the spoon bowl out. I hope that makes sense, but anyway, we'll go back to the forging.
the forging is complete. I put it in some pickle for a little bit to dissolve the scale. And this is what I mean when I'm talk when I say I use wrought iron. You can tell there's some grain to this. This is uh, this is actually pretty decent quality wrought. But you can tell, hopefully, you can see that there's grain to this, which is cool because it illustrates the forging really well. You can kind of you can put to put the pieces together enough to see exactly how something was forged if it was etched wrought iron. But luckily I'm not that kind of, I don't do that kind of shit. I'm not interested in polishing and etching wrought iron because I feel like it's uh, uh, kind of a stupid fad right now. I dissolved the scale because it makes for easier cold work on something like this. Since I do so much filing, the scale is harder than my file, which would result in dulling of my file. So in order to get long life out of my tools, I dissolve the scale, which saves me a lot of time. It's also a passive process, so I can kind of set it and forget it. Let's begin the filing. Okay, I would like these all to be a set, right? I want them to all be relatively the same length. They don't have to be exact. Uh, but this is obviously too long, right? This guy. This, this one goes to long jail. Since I'm the, the lawyer representing this piece, before they go to long jail, your honor, I would like to maybe trim this one. What I'm going to do is basically just take the measurement of the handle here using a long pair of divider or calipers. So they're all relatively the same length, but I think it might, I think it might make a little more sense for it to be uh, somewhat closer to the fork size. So maybe we'll split the difference here. If I can get them to hold still. Yeah, I think I like that. This is about as uh, smart as I am when it comes to measuring stuff. Trim it to this length, Your Honor, so he, so they don't so they don't have to go to long jail. What the fuck am I even talking about? I'm, the psychosis is setting in. So very sophisticated, just a stupid. All right. Look how. Nice and bright and flat, that is. You can tell if it's flat if it reflects sunlight in basically all the same direction, if that makes any sense. Where if it was poorly, if, if it was an irregulated surface, it would have a bunch, you, you would be able to tell visually. I don't know, who cares? Who, who cares if anyone even understands what I'm saying right now? Kind of a crummy. Crummy forging over in this area. You see that part of the neighborhood? That's not so good over here. This is fine, but this, mm, so so. So I have a mark at which I'm going to cut it. So it'll look like that. Continue this cold working montage here. So I got the profile more or less dialed in. From here, I can begin to round the neck transition here, as well as clean up these gussets. I'm also going to give the bowl portion a little cleanup prior to dishing. So hopefully that goes well. Okay, yeah, keep this gravy train rolling. You can sort of tell how I've 
clamp this in in the vise here so if I give that a snug down it's pretty good it's nice pretty fairly secure and I do this so I can clean up this gusset up in this area here because I'm applying pressure down here where while I'm back here it wants to spin up but while I'm working up here it's not too much of a problem so I'll just uh, get get cracking here You can see that just with a few file strokes, I was able to begin to clean up the surface almost completely. There's an old saying that like five minutes at the forge saves you an hour at the bench. So if I can refine my forging before I get here, it makes the filing go a lot faster. And that's part of the part of the challenge for me is like how well can I forge to make it so my file work cleanup goes even faster. A cool thing to be good at if you ask me, but whatever. No one cares about filing anymore. <laughs> This is where we ended up with the spoon. So you can see I filed in all of the necessary transitions, front and back. I cleaned up the back of the spoon, but not the front. Uh, I'm not sure why. You can still see some of the grain in here and I kind of like that artifact of the forging. I also planished it quite a bit, so it's although it looks real rugged, it's actually quite smooth. I also cut out this chunk of bronze, which we are going to inlay right around here somewhere. Before I do that, I'm going to clean up this profile, so it's also hoping that this, uh, this grain in the raw iron doesn't decide to split on me once I start forming, but I guess we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Please go down in the comments and pray for me. So I'm gonna trim all this excess off and I think I'm gonna actually do this with the cold chisels. So I gotta pull the ugliest anvil in the world out over here. Relax, just relax. We got one side, one side looking pretty, hey, pretty okay. Big, big toenails for all you freaks out there. As you can tell, we have a nice, clean, non-jagged spoon blank that's ready to be formed and for people to put in their mounts. Hmm. So now I get to clean up the jagged edge with a file here and kind of crisp that shit up. Make it not so garbage. The gas forge mind could never. Okay, before it starts to snow again. Was that all? That was all out of focus. Cool. All right, dope. Oh boy, I'm starting to get nervous about that crack. Going right down the middle. Starting to get nervous about it. Okay, luckily that 
little split is superficial, so I'm quite quite pleased. Look at my ugly hands, dude. In order to regulate this bowl a little bit more, I'm gonna use a tool that I stole from Erica's studio, which is this little spoon steak. And you can kind of get the gist of it just by, you know, right? Pretty, pretty straightforward. It's uh, just a simple forming steak. It's a, it's a factory made one, but you can make these yourself. I just stole it from Erica, so uh, we'll just not tell her about that until I'm finished. But I'll just put this in the vise, and well, I'll show you there. So forming over a tool like this does two things. It allows for me to regulate the shape and the volume of my spoon bowl, as well as clean up the surface on the inside. The forge leaves crunchy scale that's a rough texture on the inside, and for something like a spoon, I don't want that. This is called planishing. So as I hammer over this mirrored steak, it has a nice surface finish on it, and my material is going to absorb some of that finish and, and become smooth on the inside, which is exactly what I want to happen. So it's a, I'm doing both things. Often when you see blacksmiths make spoons, they end up looking like real crunchy and crusty on the inside, and I do not want that to, we don't do that here. So I'm going to try to uh, smooth out this surface on the inside as much as possible so you can so hopefully you'll you'll get the gist of it there um, this also smooths out the surface on the back as well and the and I can do this cold because I'm not really trying to move the material so much I'm not forging it I'm forming it so I'm trying to achieve volume not displacement but this is all way too much information I'm just gonna start banging on this Planish side, unplanish side. I think we'll call the planishing good for now. I might do some tweaking off camera, but for the most part, it's it's a whole lot better. Yeah, you can you can see just how how much that cleaned up on the inside. It's pretty shiny, really. The next step is going to be cleaning everything up again. It got all dark from the forge oxidation, so I'm going to make it bright bright and shiny again. Then we're going to go over to the pitch bowl and do some inlay. Hello and welcome to a new segment called Goop time where we use the pitch bowl. Um, so this, I get a lot of questions about this and this, I need to, I need to stop saying this. I get a lot of questions about my pitch bowl and why I use it instead of an, a vice or a ball vice or something like that. And although those things are great and I definitely could use it, I much prefer this pitch bowl because it's, it's a bit, amorphous where it can take on the shape of the piece that I will be putting into it where a vice you're a bit more limited so I like it for that reason it's also cheap and easy to make it's a pine resin plaster Paris mixture called uh, Matsuyani it's a Japanese style of pitch I did it poorly because it's gray it should be like a jet black um, but I didn't do it right so uh, I think you can find a video of this on this guy Ford Hallam. He has a whole channel devoted to Japanese inlay and engravings and stuff like that. So I, I'm pretty sure he has a video on his channel on how to make it properly. So you should go check that out. I'll put a link in the video description. As far as the bowl itself is concerned, I just got a cheap bowl, mixing bowl from like a thrift store and filled the bottom with some lead and then poured concrete over top. So the pitch really only covers about an inch. Um, and it's still too big. I could have made this way smaller. And you also don't need to do have it in a bowl at all. You could just have it in uh, like on a plank of wood that you see a lot of Japanese metalsmiths just put it on a, 
on a block of wood and clamp that in their vise, and that works great too. Um, it's really about like the relative size of your workpiece. So for something this this long, I mean, it's it's still overkill, but it allows me to get like if I wanted to do like a big a scutcheon plate for something or something along those lines, like big sheet forms, like I can put them in this and it'd be good. But I I think I'll probably make a small one, hopefully soon. Maybe I'll do a video on that. So. Um, okay, anyway, we're ready to do our inlay. This is our inlay material. It's just a, a little chunk of bronze that I cut into a, a strip. Um, I want this to be inlaid right around here. That's where it is on some of the other utensils. And I think this is a, a nice spot for it. So I'll, I'll trim this to size, but before I even do that, we should talk about how the inlay itself is going to work. So let's head on over to the chalkboard here. We're back over at the chalkboard so I can explain how the inlay is going to stay in place. I get a lot of questions of like, why doesn't that fall out? Or doesn't that compromise the structural integrity of the, of the workpiece and all of this other stuff? And I'll, so I'll explain it with the drawing here with a little certified chalkboard moment. There are many different types of inlay and what I'm going to be doing here is a flush style of inlay where I inlay a raised piece of material, cinch it down, and then I'm going to file everything flush and hopefully it looks seamless if you do it right. And it first starts with just two, two little scribe lines. And those scribe lines act as kind of guidelines. They should relatively be, these two lines should be about the width of my inlay material, just a little bit under because I'll widen that gap to receive the inlay later. From there, I'm going to excavate a channel using a series of small chisels and then I'll file the bottom of that channel smooth with a file. Did I just say file it smooth with a file? I'm going to create a channel using a series of small chisels and then I'll file the bottom smooth. From there, once I have my channel about the depth of my inlay material, my selected inlay material should have a slight trapezoidal shape to it around the edge here. As you can tell, this is not a 90 degree angle. So the slight trapezoidal shape is going to come in handy later because once my channel is established, I will then create an undercut. And this undercut is done with a chisel that will also raise up a small burr. No. Uh, this small chisel that I'm going to use along my established channel is going to create not only a dovetail, but it's also going to raise a small burr on the top surface, which will allow for me to insert my inlay material. Once I can get my piece of inlay material seated properly, I will then use a series of small punches to pull that burr down. This is exaggerated, but you kind of get the idea. So I can insert my chunk of inlay material here. And once it's inserted, I can push this burr down. I can push that down and then I can file everything flush. Pulling this, it, the, the reason why the inlay chunk is shaped the way it is is because it's inclined to stay in this channel. It's not really gonna go anywhere once I mechanically fasten it down. I'm kind of rambling at this point, but hopefully you get the idea that the, the inlay is mechanically fastened in place. There's no glue, there's no solder, nothing to hold it in place other than the material that it's inlaid into. 
If that makes any fucking sense, I have no idea. So thanks for being here for another certified chalkboard moment. So, okay, back, back to the goop time. I'm gonna continue scooping that material out. I'm just gonna seat this with a wooden punch. I ended up having to use a larger chasing tool to kind of button that down a little bit. I don't think it's gonna be a problem. I'm gonna file everything flush now and trim the ends and uh, let's, let's get to filing again. Oh yeah, baby. Look at that, nice and tight. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that, pretty seamless. It is beginning to look like a nice little set over here. Got all these these little fellows together. The spoon is nearly finished. You can see I cleaned up the inlay a bit. And now is the my favorite part pretty much where I get to add the details now. Wonderful, another, another out of focus, ah shot. Good work, Nate. Jesus. All day I was feeling like I just wanted this thing to be done, but then I put this little bead in there and boy howdy. So the spin's pretty much done. I just gotta put a finish on it and then let's go into glamour shots with the whole set. I can't believe we made it to the end of another video. If you like this video and you want to see more videos from me more frequently, make sure you interact with it by smashing that fucking like button, leaving a comment because I read all of them to Doug, or share this with your Mima because I bet your Nan would want to see 
you did this video. You can also follow me on Instagram if you want to see more goofy stuff that I'm doing behind the scenes. And thank you to my one subscriber on Patreon, Willie Bragg. And I will see you guys in the... Okay, I'm leaving. Oh yeah, I forgot to say subscribe. Consequently, the value of life for the generality of mankind consists simply in the fact that the individual attaches more importance to himself than he does to the world. Hatred. Uh-oh, teaser for the next video. What is this?